And I'll go ahead and kick us off. So we have a great fireside chat, looking forward to it. And the focus is on digital imagery. Uh, the, the two uh, gentlemen who are speaking with us now are Josh Bilo, Vice President of Strategy Sales for Result, Result Ticks, and Chris Matty, co-founder and CRO for Vorzinium. Please help me welcome them. Great. Hey, Chris. How are you doing? Bye. Yeah, thanks for having us. So today, I know you guys have been talking a lot about data. We're going to have a little chat on how, um, if you've heard the saying, a picture is worth a thousand words, right? I love that saying. But if you think about it, a picture is worth a thousand data points as well. And as we're talking today, we're going to be bringing up how essential it is to have that segment of one to drive engagement you know, across your, uh, across your audiences. And the value of the first party data, which we're going to talk about, is key to leveraging uh, uh, that, that data. So I want to tell you a little uh, story how, uh, how we met. Uh, um, and I'll let Chris introduce his company in a second, but uh, Chris and I had a meeting in Seattle where we were talking about uh, what they did for a living and we were talking about what we did for a living and he got really excited and said, Oh my gosh, I wanted to create a product like yours a long time ago, just like every founder of a company says. And um, when we got digging deeper, we, we realized there was a lot of synergies uh, of the data they're providing, including in our audience data platform and CDP and being able to leverage that. So uh, Chris, with, with that in mind, why don't you tell us uh, a little vision of how you founded the company and, and the vision? Yeah, we've been working with data for over, geez, almost 15 years now, and it all started about 12 or 15 years ago. And if you all remember back then, 12, 15 years ago, Groupon and Living Social was all the rage, and we were all getting these great offers in our inbox. And at the time, I remember I got an offer for Brazilian wax in West Seattle, which was about 45 minutes away from my house, and I was the worst candidate for being interested in a Brazilian wax. So, <laughs> We thought to ourselves with my co-founder of Versium, how can we help marketers leverage data in a far more effective way to put the right offers in front of the right people based upon their needs, their propensities, and really based upon data about that person. Uh, fast forward till today, and you know, we have thousands and thousands of data points on folks. We can do data enrichment on demographics, on purchase interests and help marketers leverage all that data in addition to their own first party data to more effectively drive their marketing initiatives. Uh, we've partnered with Resultix to be able to provide some of that data enrichment capabilities directly within their customer engagement platform, and it's been a very successful relationship. Um, so that's what we're here to talk about today. Looking forward to telling you how we help data formulate a true portrait of a customer and how that can be leveraged in marketing activity. <laughs> Chris, so what are, what are some of the challenges that you see in being able to do this, right? I mean, this isn't an easy task because everyone's talking about how to do it today. So what are some of those challenges? Well, you know, data is a, is a mess. Um, <laughs> you know, there is massive volumes of data being generated in our connected world. Uh, I don't know if people know, but 50 to 60% of the Internet's traffic is computer generated. It's not even people. That often finds its way into form fills and all kinds of other areas. Not to mention, there's uh, all sorts of errors, data error entries, all kinds of problems, field shifts. I mean, we've seen every kind of problem you can imagine with data. Uh, one of the biggest problems is, you know, enterprises do not have data expertise to address all these, all these issues. Right? If you think of Amazon as a major e-commerce player, they're really a technology company. They started as a technology company. They're really a data technology company. They know how to utilize all this data most effective to put the right offers in front of the right people so that they buy. When you contrast that with, say, Costco or some other major e-tailer that got into e-commerce, and they don't have that in their own DNA, they're just not used to leveraging all of this data, all these, all these challenges. So there's, the challenges we see is, do the enterprises have the right sophistication? Do they have the right knowledge? Do they have the right tools to maximize the value of data? You know, the average enterprise has 91 MarTech cloud services. <laughs> Think about that. You've seen those pictures with those, you know, millions of logos. Each one of those systems generates data or deals with data. And within the enterprise, that creates one of the bigger problems we've seen, which is data silos, 
where this tool has this set of data, this tool has another set, multiply that times 91, you've got a real problem. I know part of the value of your guys' system is that you can consolidate some of this data, so maybe talk a little bit about that. Yeah, and I think that's key, uh, is really to create this portrait we're talking about as we're painting a picture, right? You know, it's really, think about those 90 systems. You know, I mean, it's daunting just to think about how do you combine all that data and centralize it in one area and bring all these parts of the picture together, kind of going back to, you know, a picture can paint a thousand words and, you know, vice versa. Um, how do you do that? So that's where we come in as an organization, helping companies centralize that data. And, um, you know, I think there's a component to that, uh, Chris, where you, really that partnership works out in terms of the cleansing and some of the other things that you guys do, right? Yeah, I think the first, the first step in creating this portrait that you can utilize in your, your marketing activities is bringing the data in from all of these different systems into a centralized location deduping, because in one, rec in one system it might be Rob Smith, in another system it might be Bob Smith, and yet another system it might be R Smith. How do you use identity resolution solutions to bring all this data together, cleanse it, fix the errors, you know, forget the hit shift two, you don't get an at symbol, you get a two, right? So lots of issues that happen within data entry and different avenues where data is sourced. So bringing it in through all these systems, through an integrated platform, cleansing it, deduping it, using identity resolution to centralize it is really the first step in creating this picture. But that's only really the beginning. Um, you know, once you clean it and dedupe it, now you can start looking at what is the insights you derive from it. And in the financial institution, there's all sorts of financial services, there's all sorts of insights that can be derived from the visibility and the touch points and the knowledge you have about what the customers are doing. And I know Resultix works with some of the largest financial services institutions in Asia. In fact, they work with the largest bank in Asia. I, I know you see all this, this type of stuff all the time. What are some of the insights that can be derived from the data once it's centralized? Yeah, I, I think as part of that, it has to be a win-win, right? It has to be win for the customer, win for the, the, the financial institution or bank. For instance, somebody makes a large deposit, and some of us might have seen this before, and within moments, that large deposit can funnel through your bank or institution somewhere else, right? Missed opportunity when we could have leveraged that information, which we've helped companies do. Those are all insights and indicators that, okay, maybe we should talk about investments. Maybe we should talk about other concerns they might be having. The other thing is these real-time best offers, right, you know, for a home loan. What are those indicators? You know, they're all there. We just need to be able to take advantage of them. So we're helping companies really take advantage of those key indicators, right? It has to be a win for the customer where they have to get something out of it, right? We have, you know, by us understanding the data and then us being able to win as a financial institution uh, to be able to, you know, place their money where it needs to go or help them with a loan, uh, et cetera. But the picture is not yet complete yet. Still, is it, Chris? Yeah, so I think, you know, going back to what you just said, I think one of the key parts of centralizing that data is it allows you to use it in real time. You're creating next specs offers, things of that nature, based upon the insights that the enterprise now has in a place where it can be utilized most effectively. But as Josh said, you've kind of got a partial, a, po a part of the picture. Um, because that picture is based upon the interactions that the enterprise or the financial services institution has with their customers, i.e., did they make a big deposit, did they just apply for an auto loan, or whatever, whatever it may be. Uh, and that's part of the picture, but oftentimes the enterprise only has a limited set of perspective or data. And so one of the areas where we come in in our partnership is to enrich the first party data based upon the data that's gathered through the enterprise's touch points with additional data elements, um, such as firmographics, such as demographics, such as purchase interest. And that's really powerful because now when you, what are you going to do with this data once it's centralized? There's a whole slew of things you can do with this data, which, which Josh will get into in a moment. But to optimize the marketing activity, the more you know about the customer, the better. Now, if you know based upon your interaction something that involves an activity that, that relates to you know, their banking uh, you know, activities with you as, as their customer, 
But what about demographics, right? When you want to do a creative or a messaging or a marketing to maybe cross-sell or upsell them, or maybe they put a big deposit in and now you want to introduce them to your investment services versus have them take that money out and go to someplace else. Well, what's the messaging? What's the creative? What's the real-time offer that you want to do to engage that? It's all about customer engagement. And what we find is that if you, if you can tailor that message based upon the characteristics of the person, the message is much better received. So you may want to have a different message for somebody who's over 40 versus under 40. That's a simple example. But we're able to take that first party data and enrich it with literally upwards of 500 different attributes or characteristics about the person, about the household, to help that marketing message really resonate. And so that's what we do in terms of third party data enrichment to that first party data, which is generated through the interactions with the enterprise or with the bank or with the financial services entity with additional data to complete that portrait. And once you've completed the portrait, now you can start talking about what are all the things you can do with this data that's centralized. And within the Resultix platform, the most powerful thing is they help bring all the data together from these disparate sources. We enrich it with additional data elements. And within the same singular platform, you can now activate it through virtually every channel. And if I talk any further, I'll be... You'll, you'll steal my thunder. So, so, um, yeah. But we'll get, we'll, I'll let you take it from there. No, that, that's <laughs> fine. That's fine. Well, that's what's exciting about the, the partnership and, and kind of what we're doing. It's a little groundbreaking in the industry because we're running Versium as a service within our platform, allowing us to be able to do the data enrichment and everything you're talking about. I love this slide that's up here right now because it kind of... You, got, you know, if you, you want the slide, we can give it to you because you can talk about in your organizations how, look, we're at the, per, you know, we talk about personalization all the time, right? Where, is, where did people start talking about individualization? I don't know if a lot of companies are there yet. Would you agree they're still trying to get this personalization thing down? Yeah, and if you think back to, we'll move to what X-ray means in terms of AI <laughs> and where the world's going, but it used to be you'd formulate your marketing message by creating a segment. And a segment is defined based upon maybe five, eight, ten characteristics, right? So if I want to market to or I want to create a message that resonates to a population, a segment, a group of people with similar characteristics, it might be that you're pulling out the population within this data set of women over 40 who own a house, have kids, drive an SUV. And, and they're going to have a certain persona that we want to market a certain message to and we want to turn, tune the creatives. Well, that's five attributes I just talked about, five. When you think about having four or five or hundred attributes and getting into an individual characteristics, not just a segment, because that might, there might be a, you know, how many millions of people in California that match that profile? Are you able to really crystallize your message individually? Now, you know individually there's some activity like they just made a deposit or something like that. But as you can get really granular in that portrait or that picture of who a person is, you can start messaging to them on a one-to-one -one basis. And the only way you can do that effectively is in a centralized platform where the data is already there. So in real time, you can get an offer that resonates based on their needs and resonates based upon some of their characteristics. And with a system such as this, I mean, in, you know, someone walks into the, the branch that marketing message can be synchronized across every touch point. You know, email marketing, SMS marketing, social marketing, broader digital, notifications on the website when they come back in, customized content for them on the website when they visit, notifications in the actual branch store. You know, tellers see something pop up that says, hey, here's what this person needs. It's real-time knowledge about the person at an individual level and that provides greater customer service, it provides much better relevancy, it creates much greater conversion and stickiness in terms of maintaining customer engagement. And that's the power of all these different activation channels being launched from a single platform. And really, the, it comes down to attribution tracking, right? Yeah, I mean, now that you have all this data kind of in order and you've done all this stuff, now you can start taking a look at things like multi-touch attribution, attribution, you could start personalizing content based upon an individual, based upon what they just did. You know, an insurance company was just telling me, and I think I told you this story at lunch, um, that's something I'd never heard of before, something called domain switching, right? Where somebody comes into a website 
and uh, they might want to uh, get like an investment account, and then they go to a home loan, and then they go somewhere else. The challenge, they said, is we can't track them, right? When they keep on switching, and now that cookies are going away, what are we going to do, and how are we going to keep track of that journey of how they came in, because they've gone to so many different websites along the way. And I said, well, we have a solution for that. Because for one, we're, we don't rely on cookies. We can, but we don't rely on cookies. The way we had created our software was, and the way we're talking about all this data and multi-touch attribution, I think somebody in the audience before asked about cookies, so you could ask me about cookies either during the question stage or after, um, but to do all this stuff, right? Yeah, I think I'll, I'll take a comment on the cookie idea. So you know, it used to be advertisers would go out in this black box environment and they'd say, I want to target the same characteristics I described. And the way that's done via third-party cookies is that cookie, i.e. that browser, i.e. that person, is mapped to that demographic data in an offline environment and it's carried forward into populations of cookies that allow the targeting to occur. With those cookies going away, that goes away. So what that means is it puts more emphasis on enterprises focusing on their first-party data, the data they gather, it allows them to gain consent within the evolving privacy world, but the shift of cookies going, going away really means that companies need to focus on their first party data, the data they're gathering about customers, centralizing it, enriching it. So now when you want to target that digital audience that has those characteristics, you're not going out, out into some ad tech ecosystem black box to target it. You're onboarding your own data. You know, Facebook, Google, LinkedIn, they all allow you to upload data for digital targeting. And so what you want to do is formulate that portrait, the detailed picture that tells you everything about that person so you can do your best job uh, targeting. And if you go back to, you know, I'll bring it back to the point on Amazon, right? That's what made Amazon so successful. Because since they understand all these things, if you think of propensity models and recommendation engines, you know, it used to be you go to Netflix and say, well, what's, what's the, it's always amazing to me as I listen to a couple songs in today's world on YouTube, <laughs> Every song that is in my genre, I start peering and learning, and I'm loving it because behind the scenes, they have data elements that say, hey, if, if Chris Maddy likes this song, he'll probably like these other five or six or ten songs. And that's because they're able to look at other people with my profile, my picture, my portrait, and what did they like. And as soon as you start bringing that intelligence into your system, your conversion goes through the roof, your revenue goes through the roof, and you start beating bricks and mortar stores that don't have that ability. And so in the financial services industry, similarly, if you start putting these data expertises into your marketing processes, you see the same benefit. Instead of selling a, a book or a, any other product that Amazon now sells, you're selling investment products, you're selling you know, financial services, you're f selling loan products, you're selling maybe debt consolidation. It's no different. It's about understanding it from, from the digital touch points you have and then crafting it using all this different data. Yeah, and did we, did we talk about this x-ray vision thing, right? I, I know people are curious about that, and you dabbled in it a little bit, but... Yeah, so, you know, we talk about going from segments of, you know, filter by a little bit of data, meaning seven attributes that defines a population, defines your portrait, to really rich data that allows you to define an individual by all their differences individually. And so now everybody, AI, what does that really mean? And it's funny that AI is becoming such a big word now because of chat GPT and, and what it does with language. But really what AI is, is behind the scenes is machine learning algorithms, which is data, you know, processing power that is allowed, uh, or that is available. And the future really is to be able to process that data much more effectively to create what is the best offer, what is the propensity. If you know that somebody did a big deposit, then you know what products you might be able to offer them because that's real deterministic insight. You don't need a model for that. But what if there's a model to say, based upon all of the characteristics about a person, both the characteristics of their interactions with your business, in addition to the characteristics of who they are based upon third-party data associations, what if there are models to say, hey, this person might need financial services or investment services in the future? because they have the profile and they're acting and behaving like someone who's going to make a big deposit. And we really, that's what AI does, is it processes much more larger volumes of data. And in ChatGPT, it formulates that data into a sentence, into a phrase, into a paragraph, into a large document. 
But in the marketing realm, it could be used to take a look at all that data and in highly, you know, with a pretty predictive way, predict their best offer, predict their needs. So really, I think the future when we talk about personalization, individualization, individualization and then the next phase of AI and the rest is, is takes it up a whole other level. You know, we were using machine learning models to do direct marketing for uh, some major, major brands. In fact, um, Fisher Investments. And, and we just came in. We didn't know anything about investment. All we were were the data guys. And we said to their agency, give us a set of people who bought those services and give us a set of people who didn't from a past marketing campaign. Behind the scenes, we associated as much data as we could, formulated a picture, a portrait, of what those people looked like. And when I say looked like, I don't mean 10 attributes. I mean thousands of attributes. And not just what they looked like, where did they live? You know, what was the crime rate in the zip plus four that they're located? You know, government crime stats are available. And now we said, okay, we can actually now build an AI-based predictive model to say, how does this person look? Does this person look more like the person who bought or not? And behind the scenes, what, that's what that does is creates a propensity model. Now you can score the entire state of California <laughs> and pick up the people that look most like, mm -hmm. when I say most like, you know, old school targeting used regression models, things of that nature, which could handle maybe upwards of a few hundred data signals. What AI does is it handles thousands and thousands of data signals and uses machine learning algorithms, not linear regression, but neural nets, things like that. That's all that's what's happening behind the scenes in ChatGPT. Mm -hmm. And now you've got a model, and, and I can tell you with Fisher Investments, for example, we were the f highest performing marketing response rate because we used that deep portrait to build an AI-based model. And we came in without knowing anything. Without, we just said, we'll just tell you who to market to. And it kind of gets back to the original vision, was, which is, in fact, when we first built our first AI model almost 10 years ago, we did some things with real-time offers in the, in the um, couponing space, mm -hmm. right? So that we weren't sending Brazilian wax to we were, <laughs> we were sending, you know, this guy probably should send to get a golf offer, right? Because exactly. Because he likes golf, because he subscribes to golf magazine, et cetera, and so on. So the future really is where ChatGPT or is coming from and where AI is, is to use that full portrait to do even more magical stuff. But I think we're even a ways from there. I mean, first step is they got to centralize their data, they got to enrich it, they got to identify, understand, and then effectively reach Yeah, it. And, I, and we've been talking to a lot of people here where they say, uh, you know, our, our data is not centralized, but we're trying to do AI, right? Oh, yeah. <laughs> you can't do, I mean, garbage in is garbage out in the, in the AI world or anything. And if you're going to use marketing, use data in marketing, you got to, you got to fix it first. But I know we're, yeah. I could talk Let's, about data all day long, so you know, we got so, a few minutes left to ask questions, maybe we should. Uh, so really, really quick, so this is the magic wand. This is our result platform. Um, it's an integrated uh, marketing stack with data. Um, we call it connected experiences, because if you think about connected experiences, IOT is now involved. Somebody might go to an ATM. Somebody might, you know, go past a, um, a store and get an offer. There's all these things that are connected, and we're doing this in real time. This is the platform that we're enabling these companies that we've been talking about. And now, with what's exciting that we're excited about to offer to, to, to organizations is the ability to integrate with, uh, Versium into that platform to give you that holistic picture, right? To give you that whole picture that's constantly changing, right? Because as you orchestrate, you're constantly getting updates and changing the picture. New attributes are coming in. You might have, what, a thousand attributes on someone or you know, some amount that helps you be able to orchestrate and, and, and treat them like an individual person. So we've talked a lot about data, a lot of portraits. Are there any questions about <laughs> data? Uh, we'll open it up to you all. Yeah. Hit, hit me with a hard data question. <laughs> Or any question, for that matter. Or are we between you and the drinks? One or the other. Somebody did ask about, yeah, go ahead. Do you ever go to ask the cookie question again, or? No, I'm just kidding. No cookie questions, so even though it makes me hungry, though. Um, so how do you deal with, like, uh, PII kind of data? Some places, like, that becomes, like, a really sensitive subject of, like, storing all this sensitive information and those kinds of things. So. Sorry, can you repeat that? Yeah, how do you deal with like the PII information? Oh, PII, thing? yeah, yeah. So, yeah, like, especially since it sounds like you're integrating with multiple systems too, so there might be things that, um, you know, maybe like 
you're in the cloud or something and they don't want like emails or phone numbers going in the cloud and so you ask for a kind of hard one. That's I'll, let, I'll let Josh take on his portion of that question in terms of how their platform addresses it because they have some tools, but once it's in the platform, uh, everything we do with data enrichment can be done in an encrypted fashion so there's no PII transfer. So if you take in an email or a, or a contact record and you want to get demographic data back, our system can receive in, when I say encrypted, I mean a hashed email, which means it's basically a, a gobbledygook representation of, of the email. Um, but you can basically get the, you can still deliver back the same rich insights without PII transfer. So as an example, that's one thing that, that we do with data enrichment. We are, we are hypersensitive to uh, the evolving data privacy regulations in terms of what we need to do as a data provider, as a third party data offering. Some data is sensitive. Um, it's growing, it's evolving in some states, you know, ethnicity is a sensitive data. We pull all that data out, we would not en enrich it in those areas. So our expertise is to make sure that our customers that use our data enrichment follow all the rules and regulations. Mm -hmm. And then from, a, from your platform, yeah. I know you do some... Well, I mean, and, and that's the reason to centralize your data, right? I mean, the right to be forgotten is the right to be forgotten and not using my data and me knowing that you don't want me to send you an email, right, uh, or a phone call, because these are all privacy issues we're all having to deal with and getting fined for, right? So that really kind of brings up the importance of that single view of the customer or centralizing that data to one identifier so you're able to do that. We also have a hybrid approach where we work with a lot of very sensitive data uh, with banks, let's say, where we don't store any of the PII. We just utilize the data we need to make decisions and then the data stays on premise or in their cloud where it needs to be. So uh, we're not lifting and shifting any of their data in that case. Any other questions? Why is there going to be such bright light? Yeah, I can't, I can't see. <laughs> uh, so I was wondering, so what do you think are some of the biggest weaknesses or just areas of improvement throughout the digital banking customer lifecycle journey, and how, how would you address those? Well, I'll give you a bit of my perspective. You might have some others, but I think that... Um, some of the digital bank, some of the banking institutions are still rooted in old systems necessarily. I mean, is everybody on the cloud? Are they able to take advantage of the, take advantage of these 91 different services? As much as there's Martech, Martech fatigue, what we see is there's still a lot of legacy systems out there. Um, and so big enterprises tend to be a little bit slower to move and to shift from some of these. And so you end up having, when you go to do that centralization so you can effectively enrich, you don't want to enrich all that stuff. You want to enrich in central location. There's the process of, of tying into legacy systems to pull that data in is really one of the bigger issues. And then you know, getting an understanding of all the things you can do and being versed in modern you know, data solutions is the next thing I would say. Yeah, and it all has to happen in real time, right? Whatever we determine, you know, based on how fast the internet is. Right? You know, everybody expects if it's digital, you're doing anything digital, if, if they're not getting it in milliseconds, depending on latency, et cetera, you get upset and they go somewhere else or you don't know them, right? So I think there's still some challenges because people aren't centralizing banks and companies aren't centralizing that data. It's part of the journey to go on to utilize this system is there's, you know, Zoltix works with large companies like Accenture, uh, companies like that that will go in and help navigate the migration and digital transformation from legacy systems to a system such as this, which, is, which centralizes it. And once it's centralized, you, you can unlock all these different things you can do. If you've got this data set that's being used over here and this one over there, how do you get the benefits, right? You've got to really pull it into one system and then do all this activation and customer touch point from there. Um, is there any other questions? I, someone asked me a question at, at lunch. Yeah, there's a question back here? Yes. Josh, that's a sweet jacket. Where can I get one? Canada. <laughs> no, I'll give you, I'll, I'll tell you a story after we get I off. I thought it was there inside is, out. Of there, is a, there is a story <laughs> behind this jacket, so I'll, I'll tell you that story. You know, what somebody no, asked me at lunch, how do you effectively associate this data? In 10 seconds, I'm running out of time, but it's all about an identity engine. It's not about just having a data set. You've got to be able to use uh, what we call an identity engine, which is how do you identify effectively a person? And really, identifying a person, you identify them by first name, last name, and address, an email, a phone number, a mobile ID, the different 
touch points with them in, into the enterprise, and you have to have a tool that properly associates data based upon that entry point, right? Rob Smith, Bob Smith, R. Smith is the same person. If you've got other data you can triangulate from, address data, different sort of different data sets, location, well, all of a sudden you've pinned it down to it might be the same person, but it's all about identity resolution and how do you confidently assign additional data. That's really a key thing that sits underneath all of this. Wonderful. I think we're well, Thanks, Chris. Yeah, I think we're going to get, like, the music's going to start playing and we're going to walk off the stage. Well, thanks, everyone. Thanks for the time today. Hope. Okay.